welcome home. Is there any doubt in your mind that because so many of those big, huge, larger-than-life stars smoked, that that encouraged people around the country to smoke? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. If there's no doubt that Humphrey Bogart encouraged people to smoke in the 40s, is there any doubt there's more smoking in movies these days than in the boardroom at Philip Morris? I cannot believe that the tobacco companies are not in some way or other involved in this. Dr. Malefe Asante is chairman of African American Studies at Temple University. He and other scholars firmly believe in Afrocentrism. Some say Socrates was black, and so was Cleopatra, and so was Hannibal. All this, they say, would be common knowledge if there was not a European, a white conspiracy to suppress the facts. I'm not in favor of cooking the evidence uh, for however good a cause it is. Talk about your population explosion. There are more white-tailed deer in America's suburbs today than there were in the whole country when the Pilgrims landed in 1620. Cute as they are, they're a menace. But anytime someone suggests getting rid of them, they think of Bambi, and they think that there's a bunch of hunters going out, and they're killing Bambi, Bambi's mom, Bambi's dad. And that essentially is the problem. Nobody wants to kill Bambi. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Steve Croft. I'm Leslie Stahl. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. This Smithsonian Minute brought to you by NCI One. Life just got simpler. In 1871, landscape painter Thomas Moran joined a Department of the Interior Geological Survey of the area around Yellowstone River. He had never seen mountains so majestic or skies so breathtaking. The sketches for this painting helped convince Congress to designate Yellowstone as the country's first national park. How many states can you visit and never leave Yellowstone? The answer after this. Need a cell phone? You got it. A pager? It's here. The internet? Long distance service? With MCI One, you not only get a package deal, you get to decide what's in the package. MCI One, life just got simpler. Yellowstone National Park covers parts of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. I'm Barbara Bush. The Smithsonian, celebrating 150 years. When you set out to hatch something that's brand new, you gotta have all your ducks in a row. Oh, you've probably got a pretty good idea of how you think a luxury car handles, but you haven't set foot in this one yet. When you push, it performs. And when you lead, it follows. It's fast, it's fun. It's fiendishly flexible. Katerra. A whole new ride from the luxury leader. It's the Caddy. The Ziggs. Teenagers who have everything, and it's still not enough, so they become prostitutes. Selling themselves for a designer label will investigate Monday on the CBS Evening News. The last time you went to the movies, did you notice people smoking? Not in the theater, it's never allowed there. But up on the screen, you can't get away from it. Smokehead! From Jim Carrey's Puffs and the Mask to preteen smokers in Milk Money. After sex, you smoke. It's a rule. No, to the recent She's the One, where nearly every heartthrob character lights up. That's what makes me a success. There's more smoking in movies these days than in the boardroom at Philip Morris. Would you like a cigarette, Nick? Sharon Stone smokes all the way through this famous scene and lots of others. Secondhand smoke does kill too, you know. Not reliably. Hot 20-something stars like Gwyneth Paltrow and Uma Thurman light up in movie after movie. And then there's the queen of the Generation X movie smokers, Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder has probably done more damage to young girls and encouraged more young girls to smoke than any other actress in America, I think, because she does smoke all the time in every single movie she makes. Ever since Joseph Califano left Jimmy Carter's cabinet as Secretary of Health, He's been campaigning against cigarettes. 
he sees a direct connection between on-screen smoking and real-life kids, whether it's girls watching Winona Ryder or boys imitating Bruce Willis. Find him if you got him. Way ahead of you, partner. That kind of thing, in my judgment, has a tremendous impact on young men. I mean, Bruce Willis is a superhero to any teenager in this country. I mean, he's the great cop, and he's smoking all the time. And that does encourage kids to smoke. They're all doing it. John Travolta does it in all of his movies. All the action heroes, these guys who are supposed to be athletic. And they all look strong, and they all look muscular. And they look healthy. It's like the Marlboro Man. All it over is again. the Marlboro Man, except as we know, the Marlboro Man end up in the cancer ward. Humphrey Bogart ended up with cancer, and a lot of other old-time movie actors did too. In the black and white days, most stars smoked in most movies. I think it was cool. It was, uh, for the men, it was a kind of a sign of virility. Joe Roth wasn't around in those days, but now he's one of the most powerful people in Hollywood, chairman of the biggest studio, Disney. I think it was... Um, a culture that looked upon smoking as something that was sophisticated and debonair. Sexy. Sexy. Glamorous. Absolute, powerful. Absolutely. It was part of the Hollywood image. Is there any doubt in your mind that because so many of those really... big, huge, larger-than-life stars smoked, that that encouraged people around the country to smoke? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. If there's no doubt that Humphrey Bogart encouraged people to smoke in the 40s, is there any doubt that John Travolta and Keanu Reeves are doing the same thing in the 90s? Have you gone to the movies lately and seen a lot of the most glamorous... Yeah, I saw Feeling Minnesota on Friday, and I was just surprised by how many people in that movie smoked. It's just a surprise to see Keanu Reeves smoking, and, like, he did it, like, really cool, you know, like, threw the cigarette and caught it in his mouth, and, like, it was this big thing. Is there a message to kids coming out from the movies, do you think? Sure, it's cool. Yeah, basically the message that's being said is this is the, the cool thing to do. If, if you don't, you're uncool. It's glamorous. You know, it's trendy. It's whatever. Whatever. It's making kids pick up cigarettes. I cannot believe that the tobacco companies are not in some way or other involved in this. Joseph Califano charges that the reason so many actors are lighting up is that cigarette makers are paying them to do it. Certainly, it used to happen, and documents taken from the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company prove it. In this 1983 letter, Sylvester Stallone promised to use B&W cigarettes in five feature films in exchange for $500,000. Philip Morris paid to have the Marlboro brand show up in a Superman movie and to put its Lark brand in a James Bond film. Tobacco companies insist they stopped making such deals in 1990. I can only speak for Disney. I can only speak as the head of the studio. If they're paying under the table, the table hasn't reached the building. You do know that years back, yes. there were contracts. Yes. Do you know for an absolute fact that that's not going on? No. It could be going on. Absolutely. Think it is? I don't think so. Roth may be right. We couldn't find any evidence that tobacco company payoffs are still going on. It's all the more remarkable, then, that movie smoking has made such a huge comeback. After the Surgeon General first warned about the dangers of cigarettes in 1964, Hollywood did just what the rest of America did, cut down on smoking. I'm going to walk over there, and I'm going to take that cigarette away from you. In the 70s and 80s, the few characters who did smoke were bad guys, sick people, or idiots. You pollute the air with your smoking. Polluting, disgusting, smelly. That continues to be society's consensus about cigarettes. So why is Hollywood suddenly so full of smoke? What's going on? Explanation number one. Movie makers just like the way smoke and cigarettes look on film. Thelma, what are you doing? Smoking? Explanation number two the ignorant and immoral young yeah. director's theory. I think there are young filmmakers who are now, you know, in their late 20s and early 30s who weren't part of the Surgeon General scare. So now they're uh, rebellious and they want to show, you know, people in their 20s in exotic situations. And uh, they also, they think it's cool to smoke. Which leads to explanation number three. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. 
it's cool to smoke because the grown-up establishment condemns it. Do any of you think you smoke because adults tell you not to? Is that yeah. part of it? Yes. Absolutely. We're rebels. You're rebels? What did, what did you say? Um, I said, <laughs> no, I said, I said the fact that, that parents and adults tell us it's wrong, it's bad, et cetera, et cetera, probably pushes us to smoke more. Whether it's high school kids or movie stars, an awful lot of young people see cigarettes as powerful symbols of rebellion. Most of these actors, or many of these actors in real life, do smoke. What they do in real life is totally their own business. But what they do on the screen is everybody's business. They're public figures then, and I think they've got to accept some public responsibility. But no one is accepting responsibility. Smoking has even made a comeback on television. The government banned TV tobacco ads in 1971. Mind if I smoke? But with exposure like this, who needs ads? Characters are puffing away on top shows. Third Rock from the Sun. Even ER. A doctor smoking? And the stars aren't just smoking cigarettes. It's cigars, too. It's NBC's premiere Thursday. A recent Thursday provides a perfect example. God, you look sexy. One night, one TV network rolling out its season premieres. You, Jerry, are the doofus. It's everywhere. And 3,000 teenagers start smoking every day. When we have positive role models smoking on camera, it has got to be a contributing factor. So what do you think about that? I think it's terrible. What would happen if Disney said, okay, there will be no smoking in any movies we put out? I think that even though the effect would be positive to the consumer, I think it would probably be misconstrued in the artistic community as, as, the, censorship. as censorship. You can't shy away from what people actually do. Um, you just run into all kinds of trouble. Paul Oster is a novelist who wrote the movie Smoke, and directed another blue in the face. How's it taste? It tastes great. To him, it's all about artistic freedom. If it comes down to a fight between tastes great and social responsibility, tastes great wins. Now the fact is, people do smoke in the world. And to deny it would be stupid. If we start restricting what's possible in works of art because we are opposed to these things in the world, well, Maybe we're against alcohol, so we can't allow any drinking in films. And the next day, maybe we're against uh, people using four-letter words. Therefore, we can't allow that to happen. Is there no exception when you have a public health hazard, as we do with smoking and cancer? Um, I don't think this is the battleground. Um, I, uh, this is not the place to fight the battle about smoking. That we-must-be-true-to-reality argument right. falls flat, though, when you realize how much movie smoking is unreal. Do you smoke? Take that Bruce Willis cop character in the Die Hard films. The real character probably wouldn't smoke. The real character he'd probably... be a health fanatic. No, not he? only would he be a health fanatic, most police forces in this country prohibit smoking by policemen because it's bad for their health, it's bad for their wind, it's bad for them on the job. Here, part of your qualification for command. The Pentagon says, no, it's not. After all, Crimson Tide, a thriller made by Joe Roth's Disney, was set on a nuclear submarine. They don't smoke in those places on submarines. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it fights the real characters in yes. the movie. Yeah. I suppose, you know, again, I was here, certainly watched that film being shot. Yeah. So, um, I suppose if I thought I didn't think about it... I... Most studio executives don't think about it. And Joe Roth didn't until we sat down in his office and talked. There's no smoking in restaurants. Right. There's no smoking in airplanes. I mean, there's no smoking in many offices. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the only place there's smoking is in the movies. Yeah. Well, look, I think it's wrong. You know? I think it's wrong. And I think the need to educate, a, you know, the 20-something generation that's coming up, that it, it's not square in their face the way it was when it was a revelation to those of us in our 40s. But if anybody can educate them, mm -hmm. on this planet, it has to be Hollywood. I agree. I agree. I mean, when you really think about consolidation, there are only six studios.
Do you think that if I got all six of you, the, the heads of all six studios in a room, that they'd all talk the way you do? We don't like it, we wish it weren't happening? That's my guess. If, in fact, each one of us took the time to tell our production heads and our physical production heads that no one can smoke without, in, a, in a film without permission that comes from the head of the studio, you would see a great decrease in smoking on films. Would you do that? Um, I think I'd say something like that. I actually do. I think I'd say something like that. Well, if you do, let us know. Okay. When the movie's rating board is deciding whether to give a film a PG, a PG-13, or an R, it considers violence, sex, language, and drug use. But smoking? It's not even a factor. By the way, Joe Roth never did get back to us, so we called him recently. He hasn't done anything to change Disney's policy regarding on-screen smoking. If you're a woman who suffers from irregularity, you should know that year after year, women have trusted one brand of laxative more than any other, Correctol. Unlike many laxatives, including most Ex-Lax products, Correctol tablets contain no phenolphthalein. Instead, they contain the ingredient recommended most by doctors for safe, dependable overnight relief. Gentle relief you can feel good about. Correctol, caring for women for over 40 years. Somewhere between cloud white and slate gray is a color called fog. One of the colors between the colors created by Canon Laser Color. Canon Laser Color. Its only competition is reality. New Axid AR. The only one that says right on its labeling. For many, it can prevent heartburn completely. That's something two Tagamet HB, Zantac 75, and Pepsid AC just don't claim. New Axid AR. Proven it can prevent heartburn completely. Over the last 150 years, all kinds of companies that said they'd be there when you needed them didn't stand up to their promises. That's life. Our policy of thoughtful, prudent investing has kept us, well, a pillar of strength for the last 150 years. That's New York Life, the company you keep. The Value Drive is on during Oldsmobile's Value Drive sales event. Make the smart choice with Cutlass Supreme, all the roominess, performance, and features you need. Plus, for a limited time, Oldsmobile is clearing out all remaining 96s. And with special factory to retailer incentives on new 97 models, you have an even greater opportunity to save. Cutlass Supreme by Oldsmobile. The time to buy is now. The Value Drive is on. See your Oldsmobile retailer today. CBS Tonight, a miniseries too important to miss. God offers us courage and hope. The Clutter family had it all. If anything were to ever happen to me. Oh, Herb, you're a young man. <laughs> Until one night, two men took it all away. Anthony Edwards, Eric Roberts, in cold blood. CBS Tonight. A jumbo jet hijacked. A man jumps out of the back of the plane. It happened 25 years ago, but the legend lives on. The mystery of D.B. Cooper, tomorrow on This Morning. Back in grade school, you probably learned that many of the world's most important ideas were born during the golden age of Greece, the cradle of our civilization that nurtured our ideas of democracy and human rights. But now there's another view of world history being taught in American classrooms. It's called Afrocentrism. It goes beyond acknowledging certain achievements generally agreed to have their roots in Africa. It states unequivocally that many of the great ideas attributed to ancient Greece come not out of Greece, but out of Africa, particularly ancient Egypt. Our major point about ancient Egypt and Greece is that the ancient uh, Egyptian people, who were black people, contributed to the development of Greece, that Greece was not a miracle. Dr. Malefi Asante is chairman of African American Studies at Temple University. Asante is the most prominent of a group of scholars who believe that in American education, so-called Eurocentrism rules. We are taught that most of our great ideas are rooted in Greece and Rome. In fact, says Asante, many of those ideas were stolen by whites from blacks. So that in a sense, what this is doing is building a notion for white supremacy. 
It is the fundamental basis of white supremacy in the American society. This notion well, how that is, the Greek civilization how is, is somehow... Well, how is the idea of civilized society, of Plato's Republic, or of democracy, the very word democracy, how is that racist in some way? No, what is racist is to build a whole curriculum on the idea that the Greek society was miraculous and different and had no influence from Africa. By Africa, Dr. Asante generally means ancient Egypt. He and other like-minded scholars believe that Egypt is the true fount of Western civilization. Some go even further and say, for example, that Aristotle stole his ideas from an ancient Egyptian library ignoring the fact that Aristotle was dead before the library was even built. And some say Socrates was black, and so was Cleopatra, and so was Hannibal. All this, they say, would be common knowledge if there was not a European, a white conspiracy to suppress the facts. I think there is no conspiracy, and I think cultures don't steal from one another. It isn't like stealing a car or something from Egypt. It, if that kind of culture had existed in Egypt, it would still have remained in Egypt. Mary Lefkowitz is a professor of humanities at Wellesley College. She was known only for her contributions to classical education until she published a book this year called Not Out of Africa, a frontal attack on the substance of Afrocentrism and on the teachings of Dr. Asante. I felt that the past was being distorted for political purposes. And that's always very dangerous, whoever does it. Is there a conspiracy of silence, in effect, among academics to not question some of what you might regard as more outrageous statements made by Afrocentric academics for I, fear of being charged with racism? I think that fear is very great. If it's used against you, you were marked and you... Uh, you were in danger of being accused of all kinds of things. And I think most people would rather not have the plaque and get on with their work. Is Mary Lefkowitz a racist? Well, I think she is ignorant. I think that she's ignorant. And I think she's that a she's a distinguished probably, scholar. Well, you can be distinguished in this society and still be racist, can't you? I mean, we have many examples of that. But no, I think that in Mary Lefkowitz's case, I found that she was woefully ignorant of African history. Can you hear me? Maybe you don't want to hear me. Um, Afrocentrists dismiss me Lefkowitz's ideas out of hand, with a kind of anger and suspicion on view at this debate in New York, in which the moderator was hardly moderate. Professor Lefkowitz, have you uh, been to Africa? No, I have not been to Africa. <laughs> have you studied in Africa? No, I have not studied in Africa. I never said I did. In writing as prolifically as you have on ancient Greece, have you been to Greece? Yes, many times. I thought so. <laughs> Egyptian civilization predates Greece. It is more monumental. It is more majestic. There's more writing about it. But it's not in the departments of classics. But that sounds, so, almost, that sounds the, racist to me. What sounds racist? That, that the Egyptians were more monumental, more fact. this, more that. But it's fact. Superior. No, no, it's superior. not. No, we don't, I'm not talking superiority, I'm talking fact. We don't know what color the Egyptian people were, but from the evidence that's available, they were a range of colors, um, and they were not a Nubian or black people, as I imagine my ancestors from the west coast of Africa um, had been. Glenn Lowry, an economics professor at Boston University, is one of a group of conservative black scholars who have serious reservations about Afrocentrism. Not the least of reasons, Dr. Lowry says, is that African Americans are Americans first. We are a quintessentially American people. On the eve of the Civil War, some 98% of blacks in the South were born in the United States. They did not just get off of a slave ship. We are Americans. And uh, that's one of the things that disturbs me about the way in which people so easily sort of hand off the teaching of history to, you know, a concern about things that go on in Africa many millennia ago. This obelisk in front of us is representative of Egypt. 
History, of course, has its political uses. Just listen to Louis Farrakhan at last year's Million Man March. White supremacy caused some white folk to try to rewrite history and write us out. White supremacy caused Napoleon to blow the nose off of the Sphinx because it reminded you too much of the black man's majesty. Louis Farrakhan said that Napoleon shot the nose or the face of the Sphinx because it had Negroid features and didn't want to. Yeah. There's no evidence for that. And I don't, but I don't, but, but that's Why aren't you out there shooting those arguments down? Well, uh, the arguments I'm shooting down are the more racist arguments. And the argument he's raising up is that young black Americans come from a glorious rich heritage, but they won't learn about it in American public education, which glorifies only white European achievement. People talking about Shakespeare, you wonder, are there any black writers? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Black children have self-esteem. They like the way they are. They like the way they talk, walk, think, sing. This is not a problem. The problem is that the school system denies African-American children cultural esteem. And the denial of cultural esteem is the fundamental problem for the lack of motivation. It's the fundamental problem also for the lack of success in terms of African-American children. Asante's ideas are being put into practice. More than a dozen cities have introduced some form of Afrocentric education. Among them, Cleveland's Iowa Maple. It's a 600 student elementary school where the full Afrocentric curriculum has been in place for two years. You will have to use what is called on your first line, a hypothesis, which the is school a regime offers much of the standard curriculum, How many cups but there's an infusion of what Asante calls Afrocentric information into every subject area. Uh, ah. The only uh, early language yeah. program is yeah. one in Swahili. Hey. All right, you need your pencil out, please. In many Afrocentric schools, including Iowa Maple, teachers work from a series of African American baseline essays that were written more than a decade ago as curriculum guides for the public schools of Portland, Oregon. Over the years, some of the essay's authors have been under attack for falsifying credentials and historical concoctions. Among the claims in the baseline essay on science, for instance, is the assertion that the ancient Egyptians actually knew how to fly. Margaret Bowers Mosley is the school's principal. There is um, some literature that actually says that uh, the, the, the idea of not only flight, but the idea of levitation was there at this time. So, so that the ancient Egyptians mm -hmm. actually practiced flight. I'll go. Harambe. I said, I'll go. Harambe. We welcome you to Harambe. Harambe means let's all pull together. During Harambe, we recite our literature and our poetry, and we go forth because we know from whence we came. Among the things, mm -hmm. I, I think, the things that, that get people upset mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Afrocentrism, black and white educators mm -hmm. both, are things like the reason the face of the Sphinx has been defaced mm -hmm. is because Napoleon's troops didn't want it to be seen that the Sphinx had Negroid features. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You believe that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have Negroid features, yes. Uh, and that's why the nose is gone. And that's the reason. Egypt is the home of many pyramids. So why did the people chip and destroy some of the faces on the pyramids? Our beauty should have lived on. Our beauty does live on. What do you think you're learning here that you wouldn't be getting at, uh, at another school? I think we learn more about our African culture and our heritage, that we came from kings and queens, mm -hmm. and we weren't just slaves, we were smart people. Do you think going to this school will make a difference in your lives as you go on to high school and to college? Yeah, yes. it'll make a difference in my life. It will? Mm -hmm. 
because when I grow up, I'll be able to tell my um, kids about their heritage, tell them that they came from kings and queens. Mm -hmm. I might be a king. Many of the kids said to me, uh, one of the things that they learned here was that they came from kings and queens. Mm -hmm. This is a big, seems to be mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, versus we come from drug dealers. No full-scale public school Afrocentric program has been in place long enough to demonstrate whether the approach has any long-term academic merit. The teachers at Iowa Maple do say behavior at the school has improved. You go to Detroit, you go to North Philadelphia, the west side of Chicago, and you take a look at the disorder and the meaninglessness and hopelessness in the lives of so many young black people. And I think it's not obviously wrong that African garb, African food, and a kind of heavily ethnocentric focus of meaning to those young people. You don't know who you are, that's why you're wasting your life away. If you knew what a great people you were, you would walk with pride with your head held high and you wouldn't squander your life and throw away your opportunity. That kind of uh, cultural chauvinism uh, maybe works but it has its dark side. Anything that either invites other Americans to look upon inner city blacks as different from themselves, or suggests to the inner city blacks that their future is in any place other than the mainstream of America, is a dangerous thing. We can look at Afrocentrism as a kind of religion, that it is an inspiriting religion. It builds confidence. It strengthens the people who subscribe to it. But do you see a, a, any lasting harmful effect of the sort of teaching you're talking about? Well, yes, because it encourages hatred. And it also encourages people to stick with belief systems and not use analytic and critical thought, of which all human beings are capable. Aren't you putting young African-American students at risk, really, and making them distrust, distrust the, the very system that's supposed to train them for getting on in life. Well, there's a lot to distrust. I think there's a lot to distrust in the system. You can go to school in America and come out in 12 years or 13 years and not have a coherent understanding of the presence of Africans in this country. That's a crime. That's the real danger. More and more people are discovering that Radio Shack has exactly what kids want for the holidays, including truckloads of RC cars. Whether you want digital proportional steering, four-wheel drive, or turbo features, just ask the RC car experts at Radio Shack. How do they get to be such experts? They do their homework. Radio Shack, you've got questions, we've got answers. Looking for historically high-performing mutual funds? You'll find lots of them and more right here. Mutual Fund One Source from Schwab. 600 funds, no loads. Call now for the select list free. minutes a CBS News magazine will continue CBS tonight Delta Burke in an unforgettable role I told my baby for fifty dollars a powerful story of redemption touched by an angel the homecoming after 60 minutes it's an unforgettable network premiere only one woman knows the truth 
Everyone I've told about the brief is dead. Julia Roberts. Only one man can tell her story. These men will do anything not to be exposed. Oscar winner Denzel Washington. John Lithgow. From John Grisham. An unforgettable thriller. The Pelican Brief. CBS Wednesday. CBS. Welcome home. It opens doors you never thought possible. It's Third Door Sonoma by GMC. Where work meets play meets out of bounds. And now, at the close of the 96 model year, there's no better time to get in on the action. Get your Sonoma now. And then go open a few doors of your own. See your GMC dealer today. We know this is probably the last thing you want to think about right now. So don't. Think about this. Jeep Grand Cherokee for only $349 a month. Or Jeep Cherokee Sport, now just $259 a month. Both have Jeep's legendary four-wheel drive system to get you through the deepest snow. So head over to your local Jeep and Eagle dealer today to take advantage of these deals. Then we won't ever have to think about this again. See your key states, Jeep and Eagle dealers. Melanie Alnwick, Eyewitness News 21. The most deadly animal in America isn't the mountain lion, the grizzly bear, or even the rat. According to the insurance industry, it's Bambi, the white-tailed deer. More than 100 people were killed in nearly 500,000 motor vehicle collisions with deer on U.S. highways last year, causing hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. And that doesn't include the destruction of crops or suburban shrubbery or the cost of treating Lyme disease, which seems to pop up wherever there are large populations of deer, which these days is almost everywhere outside the inner city. It's becoming a serious problem, and what to do about it is creating political minefields from Maine to Missouri, as local communities find themselves on the antlers of a dilemma. Sixty years ago, the white-tailed deer was nearly extinct. Today, there are 25 million of them. They have walked out of the forest, come to dinner in America's suburbs, and show no signs of going home. In fact, they are home. They moved here for the same reason everyone else did. They like shrubbery, and there are no predators, except for the occasional station wagon. Wildlife experts believe there are more white-tailed deer browsing backyard begonias than there were roaming virgin forests when the pilgrims landed in 1620. They have become as common as crabgrass and even more difficult to get rid of. And if you have to blame it on somebody, you might as well start with Walt Disney. 55 years ago, with one cartoon, he changed the way Americans think of the white-tailed deer. Whenever anybody hears about a deer problem, I don't care where they are, they think of Bambi. And they think that there's a bunch of hunters going out and they're killing Bambi, Bambi's mom, Bambi's dad, and that's not the case here. Here is the village of North Haven, New York, where I spend my weekends and summers. It sits on a peninsula on the eastern end of Long Island. It's only about two and a half square miles, and according to wildlife biologists, has enough open space and vegetation to support about 40 to 50 deer. The problem is, North Haven has about 600 deer, and Mayor Bob Radcliffe says they're nothing more than disease-bearing, foliage-destroying rodents with hooves. I mean, if we were overpopulated with rats, everybody would be killing them. But it's deer and their big eyes and their mannerisms, it, it just makes it very hard to get rid of them. Do you get up in the morning and occasionally and see them on your lawn and say, my God, they're beautiful animals? Yep, I do. And then, on my way to work, I'll see one splattered on the side of the road, and I keep my fingers crossed that the driver of the vehicle wasn't killed. It's not just a matter of highway safety. Deer have become a matter of public health. University Medical Center, Lyme disease hotline. According to one village survey, half the residents of North Haven have had Lyme disease, a bacterial infection that causes fatigue, headaches, joint pain, and can create serious medical problems if left untreated. The disease is carried by ticks, who like to travel by deer. And public health officials believe there is a direct correlation between a high incidence of Lyme disease and deer overpopulation. 10 years ago, the deer problem would have been solved with a couple of good hunting seasons. 
And in places like Fox Chapel, Pennsylvania, outside Pittsburgh, expert archers are being auditioned to call the herd away from curbside. But in North Haven, like most other suburban communities, hunting is illegal. Although people can obtain nuisance permits to kill deer on their own property, providing there are no houses within 500 feet, that it's done within certain hours with a shotgun or bow and arrow, and that they don't harm placard-carrying animal rights activists who might be out in the woods trying to disrupt the shoot, which happens from time to time. It's very hard in this day and age to think of killing as a way of solving a problem. It goes against the grain in which we've been brought up with in the last, you know, since Vietnam, say, where war is not an answer. And that's what we're at here. We're at war with animals. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough battle. And a loud one. I'm not here to argue. Uh... When deer are on the agenda at the village trustee meetings, there is usually a full house and the decibel level soars. We have no answers. Thank you. Five years have passed since North Haven formed a committee to get rid of the deer, and since then, the deer population has actually gone up 30 percent. Village trustee Pat Frank Belay was chairman of the committee for a while until she resigned in frustration. People say, I don't care what you do, just get them out of here. I don't care how it happens, get rid of them. And I don't see why you can't do this, and I don't see why. And, but they haven't studied the problem. They look out and see the deer eating everything, and they don't want them there. And they don't realize that it's not easy. It's difficult. You're stymied everywhere You're you stymied, turn. stymied, yeah. There are lots of plans. Everybody has a plan. What North Haven lacks is consensus. And it's a matter of whether we want to continue the animosity in the village or, or pay for peace. Half the people in town see this as a deer problem. The other half see it as a people problem. The issue in terms of North Haven is that there are too many unfavorable deer encounters with human beings. Kevin Conboy, Gail Rolson, and Jean Burke belong to a broad coalition that goes by any number of committee names. The mayor calls them the deer people. But it would be wrong to assume that even this group agrees on everything. Some are opposed to hunting. There's just no large open area where there aren't uh, residents and homes and people about and pets about and children about. Some don't care that much about flowers and expensive shrubbery. You don't have any sympathy for people who want to plant gardens? Uh, not when it means uh, that, that they, we should kill 400 deer to, in order for that person to have a garden. And some, like Gene Burke, simply love the deer. You're attached to them? Of course I'm attached to them. I have old pal, Amber, man alive, go all the way down. Sweetie pie, hate to have to tell you. Deer are not pets, the wildlife. Do some people here treat them like pets? Oh, of course, that's brought up at meetings. You know, these are my pets. Are you hungry? Come on, sweetie. There are all sorts of people in North Haven who feed them like pets to keep them from suffering and starving to death during the winter. Are you still hungry? You ate so much today. But in their compassion, they are also interfering with nature. And that's one of the reasons the herd now numbers 600. There are more deer here than in a game preserve. Frank well, Bramer is, lives uh, between two people who feed the deer. Whenever they put out the corn and bread and apples, he says, there's a stampede right through his front yard. I mean, it's our regular feast. <laughs> he says one neighbor claims to spend $600 a week feeding the deer. That's a lot of money. It is. Uh, I wish he'd put a little paint on his house. Last year, Bramer decided to take his fate into his own hands by getting a nuisance permit and bringing in a bow hunter to shoot deer on his own property. See, there's a group of them down in there. The neighbors sued him for a million dollars, claiming it caused mental duress. A million dollars worth of duress? Yes. Have you thought about moving? Yes. You know, it, uh, but I'm just stubborn enough to stay. <laughs> Bramer, like most of his neighbors in North Haven, is being forced to adapt to the environment. They build 10-foot-high fences, swath their shrubbery in protective netting, and experiment with all sorts of mojos and potions to keep the deer away. Some people use bags of human hair, bars of ivory soap, even coyote urine, which is very popular and you can buy at the local hardware store. The village of North Haven has investigated every method of reducing a deer herd known to man, plus a few that are still on the drawing board. There's something called netting and bolting. This videotape shows deer being lured to feeding stations and then snared in rocket-fired nets. 
Once the dust clears, the trapped deer can be put out of their misery with the same device used in a slaughterhouse. Very efficient, not much danger to the neighbors, but very expensive and very, very politically incorrect. There is trap and transport, where the deer are netted or lured into a corral with food and then put in trucks and relocated to a farm upstate. Actually, it's a venison farm upstate. It's but illegal. It goes back to an inhumane... If, you, if one's looking at... The main objection to this plan was not that the deer might end up in a slaughterhouse, but that many of them wouldn't survive the trip. Now they're going to go into a truck. Well, their only response is flight. That's all that they know how to do. Now you're going to try to put them in a truck. And then they thought, they'd be all batted up and beaten yeah, up and, so from a, uh, a and not aspect, dead. Death if, if would be if kind. Gonna, if you want to get Trap and transport was actually approved by the village trustees. Then New York State stepped in and said it was illegal under an old law that prohibits trapping. Living with gunfire and violence is not the way to do it. And there's a, there's a new technology, and I think it should be used so it can remain peaceful and safe. And that technology is? Immunocontraception. Better known as birth control, putting Bambi on the pill, or more accurately, injecting her with a contraceptive by way of a blowgun-delivered dart. It's been tried on an experimental basis in a number of places around the country, including Fire Island, New York. Who are we looking for today? But in order for contraception to work, each doe needs an initial shot, a booster shot several months later, and then an annual shot every fall, which means somebody has got to keep inoculation records on a herd of wild animals. Maria Bakai does it on Fire Island with the help of the Humane Society. She's given names to some 200 deer. How do you tell them apart? Garcia has, you see, if you look at his feed, he has white socks, mm -hmm. some horses do, and they don't all have that. Boo does, too. Um, and some have white thighs, some have a little white over the nose, and there are very distinct differences in the tails. Contraception is cut down on new births, but the size of the herd won't be reduced until the deer die off of old age. It's incredibly tame. And in North Haven, that would take a long time. The preservation party ran on the immunocontraception platform last summer in the North Haven village elections. It lost by one vote. Dr. Dean like besieged town folk in some Western movie, the people of North Haven have even implored the services of a hired gun. Dr. Anthony DiNicola, a PhD in wildlife ecology. So your job is to make deer disappear? In a sense, that's what we do. <laughs> Dr. DiNicola's nonprofit organization, White Buffalo, is a full service operation that consults and contracts with local communities all over the country. He'll do whatever you want, backyard bow hunting, trapping and transporting, netting and bolting, immunocontraception, relocation, and suburban sharpshooting. I know you're consulting for different sides in North Haven. Uh, if they came to you and said, look, we're going to turn this problem over to Tony, you solve it, what would you do? In that area, you'd have to, have to kill deer, and I would probably suggest I guess if we didn't have to deal with the social aspect, a sharpshoot. When you say sharpshooting, what do you mean? You can use noise suppression, you can use night vision, um, things that don't give the animal a fair chance. It's, again, because it's not a sport, you're trying to simply reduce the numbers in an efficient manner. What kind of equipment do you use? Um, all specialized, um, they call it counter sniper equipment, which is very accurate and um, is capable of reliably and humanely killing animals. Like hiring a hit squad? In some sense, the, the planning is very similar, as, as scary as it is to say. Think people go for that? No. <laughs> but Dr. DiNicola hasn't given up on North Haven yet. It may be after the mating season and too late to use immunocontraceptives, but he's been asked by one trustee to work on a plan to inject the deer with something that would cause an abortion. Is deer abortion a hot issue here in North Haven? It's a no one, and uh, we're probably going to have to deal with it. Do animals have a right to life? Boy, these are tough questions here, Steve. But not as tough as the questions he'll have to answer if there are 800 deer in North Haven next year instead of 600. And that's the direction things seem to be headed. 
So far this season, only about 60 deer have been taken out with nuisance permits, and there will be a brand new batch of fawns come spring. I would love them to go to uh, Animal Kingdom. I, I would love them to go to the Adirondacks. I would love them to go somewhere. But no one has come forward and said, hey, we're going to take North Haven's deer. No one has made that move. So the next... If somebody wanted to do it, you'd let them have it. <laughs> take them. They're yours. Arthritis pain, it's a part of my life. That's why I keep Advil close by. It's gentler on my stomach than aspirin. Just one works as well as two regular Tylenol. I'd give me Advil any day over a leave. With that, it could be hours before you could take more. I don't have that long wait with Advil. Advil works at the site of minor arthritis pain, stopping it where it starts. Nothing's proven to work better or last longer than Advil. Advanced medicine for pain. And for a cold, try Advil cold and sinus. It's tough on colds like Advil is on pain. This is no ordinary toothbrush. This is a Braun Oral-B plaque remover. The new Braun Oral-B Ultra. Its ultra-speed oscillating brushing action removes plaque better than an ordinary toothbrush. That's not our opinion, that's clinical fact. And its unique cup-shaped brush head cleans even below the gum line. Dentists recommend changing your toothbrush every three months. We suggest you change it forever with the Braun Oral-B Ultra. Nobody does it like you. The new Hoover Steam Vac Junior helps get spots and spills before they become stains. Nobody does it like you. It doesn't take much to make dinner kind of special. Just a little creativity. That's why I love to cook with these new recipe creations of condensed soups from Healthy Choice. Like cream of roasted chicken with herbs. Mm, unique flavors that make dinner special. And it's Healthy Choice. Over the last 150 years, all kinds of companies that said they'd be there when you needed them didn't stand up to their promises. That's life. Our policy of thoughtful, prudent investing has kept us, well, a pillar of strength for the last 150 years. That's New York Life, the company you keep. Monday, Cosby Spells Big Comedy. Oh, goody. And it's the ultimate honor. Sidney Nat's Deli is naming a sandwich after me. But this hero's hard to swallow. I think he's dead. Are you sure? Because I've been fooled by men before. And now the ink is going to fly. Don't they have any other news? Can't they find a head in a bowling bag or something? Followed by a Macarena Murphy. <laughs> then it's Sidney's reunion to remember. <laughs> it's all new CBS Big Comedy Monday. Lord knows Andy's not what used to be called the snappy dresser, but he always manages to show up in a clean shirt with a clean shave and a not bad haircut. So what's the problem? What's the problem? Well, none as far as I'm concerned, but how would you like to have 10 million people staring at you every week looking for flaws? I mean, the money's good, but I hate it. Here's a letter from a fellow named Trainer complaining about my shirts. He says my collars are too small and make my neck look funny. He says I ought to wear sleeves or that are longer so I have more cuffs showing. No one likes to be inspected that carefully. You know what else he noticed? He asked why I wear my wristwatch underneath my wrist instead of on top of it. Well, I wear it that way because I like it that way, trainer. That's why I wear it that way. On radio, Don Imus has complained about my eyebrows. Do you know what Don Imus looks like? I mean, is this man someone you'd tune in to watch on an empty stomach? I like Imus. Dirtier than necessary, but very good. They've started simulcasting his radio show on MSNBC, and I was on with him one morning. This guy's in love with the length of his own hair, and he's complaining about my eyebrows? Imus compared them to those of Pierre Salinger. There's a picture of Pierre Salinger in the current issue of Time magazine, <laughs> in which the, his eyebrow on his left, over his left eye, obscures his eyeball. Yep. Did you see Andy Rooney of 60 Minutes? He's just got, I, I, you know, why won't they address that? I, I don't. If... Salinger's the guy who went off half-cocked with that old rumor about a missile shooting down Flight 800. Salinger's eyebrows don't bother me, but it's embarrassing to admit he was once a television correspondent. Letterman even had my eyebrows on his top ten list. Number six. 
Watering and trimming Andy Rooney's eyebrows, number five. I don't know what to do. I try to look nice. I comb my hair. I tie my tie. I put on a jacket. But I draw the line when it comes to trimming my eyebrows. You work with what you got. Even the cameraman, Keith Kulin, complains about me. He's always telling me to pull my coat down and back. You know, it gets up like this. Just a few minutes ago, I put on this jacket. It's one I keep behind the door for this purpose. Well, it turned out I'd used it for dinner the other night, and there was this spot on the lapel. It's been my experience that spot removers don't remove the kind of spots I get on my clothes. They may change the size or the color of it or move it around a little, but they don't remove my spots. People are so busy criticizing what I look like that I don't think they pay any attention to what I'm saying. I'm going to tell you something I've never said before. I try to be honest with you. My reputation depends on my being honest. My hair is naturally brown. Now, I know that at my age, no one's going to believe I have brown hair, so for years, I've been dyeing my brown hair gray, so you'll think I'm honest. I'm Steve Croft. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. Now here's Dan Rather with a preview of tomorrow night's evening news. It's happening in one of the world's richest societies, teenage girls turning to prostitution to pay for luxury handbags and perfumes. And unfortunately, their services can even be purchased by vending machine. Young people selling themselves for the price of a designer label. An investigation on tomorrow's CBS Evening News. I signed another customer today. Oh, yeah? That's great. Honey, do I detect a little jealousy? Why? Just because you have a fantastic job with Warsaw Insurance. Sweetie, being a globe-hopping rock star isn't such a bad job either. It's just not as fulfilling as business insurance. Now, is it? Well, at least you've got your fans. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they're here for me. We're the business insurance experts from Warsaw. The thing I love most is opening people's eyes to new ideas. We've got to stay up to speed and cutting edge on what might be happening and taking place in these emerging countries. Investing in an emerging market brings capital and resources to that market. It's exciting to watch the transformation of the region and realize that we've been a part of it and we've made a difference. When I was young, Mom was always making sure I ate right. It wasn't always easy. <laughs> well, now we're listening to our doctors and taking better care of our health with Insure. Insure is recommended number one by doctors as a source of complete balanced nutrition. More than a vitamin supplement, Insure has all the nutrients adults need to help stay healthy, active, be energetic. Drink Insure as a meal. Or in between, Insure. To your health, Mom. Uh-uh. To our health. Insure. Recommended number one by doctors. Most successful farmer in Canada. This guy's loaded. In 1959, two men were sentenced to death for a brutal crime. We're gonna score this time and score big. But before they died, they told a story so shocking... Anybody here? ...that it must be told again. I'm gonna know what happened in that house. There's no safe, there's no money. Before you left that house, you killed all the people in it. ER's Anthony Edwards. Lord, it was perfect. Eric Roberts. I lied to you about a couple of details. And Sam Neill. I've seen some bad things, but nothing so vicious as this. CBS Tonight, an unforgettable event you can't miss.